At 10 a.m. on June 26th, the autopsy of Michael Jackson begins. Three hours later, L.A.'s chief medical examiner issues a statement. There was no indication of foul play. The medical examiner has ordered additional testing. Those tests will take approximately four to six additional weeks. With all signs pointing to a prescription drug overdose, the focus remains on Michael's private physician, Dr. Conrad Murray, who is still missing. The reason why they were unable to find Dr. Murray is plain and simple. Murray was already contacting lawyers to represent him and to plan his strategy. The following day, Murray and his lawyer agree to meet privately with detectives to give his statement. He laid out everything that had happened not just that day, but in the six weeks leading up to Michael Jackson's death. He said that Michael Jackson had told him that he regularly used propofol and needed it to fall asleep. And Dr. Murray had been giving him quantities of it every night for six weeks and then became concerned that he was becoming addicted to it. So that night, he had essentially given him substitute. Though his lawyers would later claim Murray made unspecified mistakes recounting his timeline, this is what he tells police. Starting at 1.30 a.m., he gave Michael a Valium. 30 minutes later, Michael was still awake, so he administered the sedative Ativan via IV. For the rest of the night, Murray alternated between doses of Ativan and another sedative, Versid, every few hours. Still, nothing worked. And then at that point, they had said that Michael Jackson asked for what he called his milk. And at about 10.40 that morning, after much begging and pleading, Dr. Murray had relented and given him a dose of propofol. Murray says he gave 25 milligrams diluted with lidocaine. It went straight into Michael's IV and finally, he fell asleep. Murray explains that he continued to monitor Michael for roughly 10 minutes before heading to the bathroom and that he was out of the room for two minutes maximum. You do not leave a patient who's on propofol. If something goes wrong with their heart or their breathing or whatever, you're there. To go to the bathroom for a few minutes is <laughs> it's just mind boggling. But evidence suggests the doctor was out of the room far longer than two minutes. Murray's cell phone log, which detectives later obtain, shows that from 11.18 a.m. to 12.05 p.m., Murray was on the phone with three separate callers, totaling 47 minutes. Investigators are wondering, why is he on the phone three different times? We believe that he called his office in Houston. He had a girlfriend in Santa Monica or his office in Las Vegas. Murray says that once he returned to the room, he found Michael not breathing. That exact time is still unknown. He then immediately started CPR and administered two milligrams of the anti-overdose medicine Anexate. Anexate counteracts specific drugs by blocking the brain receptors they affect, allowing those receptors to return to their usual state. When successful, sedation is reversed and the brain resumes a normal level of activity and consciousness. Unfortunately, the drug didn't work on Michael. Murray's lawyer said that only after doing 25 to 30 minutes of CPR did the doctor run to get assistance. Somebody call security! Call security! Once staff members arrived, 911 was finally called. He's not breathing. Other than the time that the paramedics came, who knows what was going on in that bedroom. There's some things here that don't add up. His argument was that nothing was given to Michael that would have killed him. He didn't do anything wrong. Coming up, investigators nail down the cause of death. And later, police dig up some dirt on Dr. Murray. Next, on Famous Crime Scene.